An exomoon is a moon which orbits a planet outside of our solar system, and it represents an outstanding challenge in modern astronomy. I've spent the last 10 years of my career looking for those damn things, and today I'm excited to tell you about what is surely the most compelling evidence for an exomoon seen to date. Greetings, cool worlders, it's David. As many of you probably know, I started out my career thinking about the ways in which exomoons might be detectable. And I have to say, back then, it was not exactly a popular topic. I remember on multiple occasions, people flatly laughing in my face when I described my research. We've only just started finding hot Jupiters. How are you going to find sub-Earth-sized moons? But I always believed that exomoons were such a clear and obvious thing to expect in these alien systems that it was really just a matter of when we would start finding these things, not if. And so, during my PhD, I wrote a series of papers about the detection techniques one might use to find moons, and then after my PhD, I kick-started a project called The Hunt for Exomoons with Kepler. It's been a long search, and over the years, we've surveyed hundreds of known exoplanets looking for moons, and yet, every time, we found nothing. Frankly, sometimes I have wondered whether my youthful enthusiasm for exomoons was misplaced. In our most recent survey, we co-added the data of nearly 300 planets together, boosting our sensitivity down to moons as small as those as the largest moons of Jupiter. Yet even here, our results suggested that such moons are rare. And I've spent a lot of time thinking about the null results that we've encountered over the years of searching. The truth is that the planets discovered by Kepler are not analogues of the planets in our solar system. Kepler is biased towards finding planets which are close to the star, and planets which are at the orbit of the Earth or further are few and far between. So perhaps the moons used to be around these planets, but as the planets migrated inwards, the moons were lost. But despite all of these new results, there was a glimmer of hope during that survey. In an act of maybe desperation, I asked my graduate student Alex to, instead of thinking about the ensemble results, go through all of these planets individually and see if anything stands out, see if there's any interesting anomalies. And indeed, one planet did stand out. Kepler 1625b. It showed about a four sigma deviation in the morphology of the light curve. That's not enough to claim an exomoon discovery, but it was interesting. So we took the planet to task, we did a full detailed moon modeling of this system, and indeed we did find that a moon was a good explanation to the data, but the moon was pretty odd. It would have to be Neptune size to explain what we saw. What was comforting though about this object is that the planet was unusual in our sample in that it wasn't a planet that was close to the star, it was one of the widest orbit planets in our sample, and furthermore it was about the size of Jupiter, the kind of planet that we might expect to have moons. The unexpected size of this moon and the fact we had such a limited data set, just three transits with the Kepler data, meant that we really didn't feel confident enough to call this a discovery, so we asked for more telescope time to try and figure out what this thing really was. We requested and were granted 40 hours of time with the Hubble Space Telescope to follow up on this star, and soon after, science journalists got very excited about what we were doing when they saw our abstract and what we were doing with the telescope as reported on NASA's public record. It certainly wasn't our plan to get anyone kicking and screaming excited about what we had back then, because frankly, we didn't think we had that much but it was true that this was probably the best moon candidate we'd seen. That alone was enough for the story to get jumbled up in popular reporting with headlines such as Exomoon Discovered all over the internet. Headlines that were factually wrong. 
we tried our best to tell our side of the story both on this channel and elsewhere but soon after we just tried to focus on the new Hubble data that was coming in and do our best job in analyzing that data set. I'll try to be concise here about our analysis of the Hubble data but if you want more details about what we did and what we found with the Hubble data then please do check out Alex Tichy's companion video to this one and he will explain to you all the steps we did in much greater depth than I have time for here. In a nutshell, our new Hubble data detects the presence of two anomalies associated with this planetary transit. Before I describe each of those, I first just want to briefly say that the Hubble data is remarkably precise. In fact, it's four times more precise than that obtained by Kepler. And that's important to remember because we only had three transits from Kepler and one from Hubble. If one of them is four times more precise than the others, then it's really going to dominate our inferences. So that's something important to keep in mind in what I describe here. Okay, so the first anomaly we detected in our data set relates to timing of the transit. So using the previous Kepler data, the three transits we had in hand, we were able to predict when we would expect the planet to transit if there was nothing else in the system. And despite that, the planet appears to transit in the Hubble data 75 minutes earlier than predicted. That's a sizable shift, and it implies that there is something in the system wobbling that planet around. Now, a Neptune-sized moon would indeed fit the bill. It could explain away why there is such a large deviation in the timings. But so too could another distant and previously undetected perturbing planet in the system. And we've seen planet-planet interactions cause those kind of timing effects in Kepler data many times before. So just seeing a timing deviation by itself, it's definitely enticing, but it's not a slam dunk that you have detected unambiguously an exomoon. Now the second anomaly is really interesting. We see this very clear and crisp transit of Kepler 1625b itself. It takes about 19 hours to complete its transit. But then three and a half hours after the transit has finished, we see a second, smaller decrease in brightness with a depth consistent with that of a Neptune-sized body. Now, there are no other known Neptune-sized transiting planets in this system because Kepler would have easily have detected such a planet during its four-year mission. So this really can't be a second planet in the system, which is coincidentally transiting at nearly the same time as Kepler 1625b. So when I saw that signature, I have to admit my heart skipped a couple of beats and I immediately thought this could be it, this could be an exomoon. But I also knew that I'd been looking for an exomoon for a long time and my judgment could be clouded by my own personal biases, my own personal investment in this search. So let's take a skeptical look at this signal. So let's start by looking at the timing of what we saw. So we know that the moon-like dip occurred after the planetary transit, and yet the planetary transit came in earlier than we would have normally expected it to. So do those two facts add up? You can think of a planet-moon system like two massive objects on a seesaw. They go around a common center of mass. And so if the planet is on one side, then the moon has to be on the other. So in that sense, the location of this moon-like dip is exactly where we would expect it to be given that the planetary transit came in early. Okay, great. But how do you know that moon-like dip is real? Maybe the instrument, the telescope, did something really peculiar at that instant in time and it somehow tricked you into thinking you saw a moonlight dip. In Alex's video, he describes a bunch of tests we tried in order to investigate this, such as looking at the photometry of a comparison star in our image, checking for any change in the telescope pointing during this time, or whether the dip appeared to be present in both the blue and the red end of our spectral coverage. We found that this moonlight dip survives all of these tests. And so as far as we can tell, it appears to be astrophysical in nature, which is to say real. But despite that, we do still have some concerns here. For instance, the instrument that we use called Widefield Camera 3 has never observed a transiting planet for this long, nor has it ever observed a transiting planet around a star this faint. So we are really 
pushing the instrument into uncharted territory. Now an example of this comes from the long-term trend in our data that you can see here. Such trends have been seen in many previous data sets with this instrument, but their origin, their cause remains unclear and is typically treated with a simple straight line fit. In our work we considered that perhaps a slightly more complicated model is needed than a straight line and so in total we tried three different models for which the moon-like dip is clearly detected in all three. But what I found personally frustrating is that we don't really have a physical reason or motivation to believe that one of those models is more likely to be correct than the other two nor indeed can we rule out that there is some possible fourth model we didn't try which represents the ultimate truth for that trend. I think what could have alleviated my own personal skepticism about this whole trend business would have been had we had just a little bit more data. Unfortunately, our observations cut off at about the time that we expect the moon to be finishing its transit. And I would have really liked to have seen more data than that so that we could have seen the star come up to its normal level, had a nice continuous baseline again, and have this cleanly resolved moon-like transit. Nevertheless, when you put it all together, the exomoon hypothesis remains the simplest and strongest explanation to this data set, to these two anomalies that we observe, because it explains both of them self-consistently, as well as explaining all the previous Kepler data. If there is no moon, then you are forced to invoke two separate explanations for these two anomalies. And so by Occam's razor, we are currently favoring the exomoon hypothesis in this system. So assuming it's real, let's talk about the properties of this planet moon system. While our dynamical fits actually allow us to measure the masses of these objects, we think the planet is probably several times the mass of Jupiter, and the moon is likely about the same mass as Neptune. The radii of those worlds, which is measured independently, actually lines up with those masses because we get a Jupiter-sized planet and a roughly Neptune-sized moon. In the paper, we actually ran a physical cross-check between the masses and radii to really make sure that this was a physically self-consistent solution, and indeed, everything checks out there too. What I find interesting about this planet-moon pair is that the mass ratio between them is 1.5%, and that's pretty comparable to the Earth-Moon mass ratio, which is 1.25%. And it's a similar story with the radius ratio, which is about a third. Not only that, but the separation between the planet and the moon is about 40 planetary radii, and that's not too dissimilar to the Earth-Moon separation, which is 60 planetary radii. So on the face of it, it kind of looks like a scaled up, supersized Earth-Moon system. So this might make you think that maybe it formed by the same way as the Earth-Moon system, maybe a giant impact, but remember these two bodies are both gaseous. And the collision of two gaseous bodies is presumably damped out. It's really unclear whether that would result in a moon such as the moon that we see for Kepler 1625b. So I think there's definitely some open questions to be resolved about what a collision hypothesis could do for forming a moon like this. Now because the planet is several times the mass of our own Jupiter, it is actually just about plausible that the moon could have formed in a similar way to how Jupiter's own moons formed, that is from a circumplanetary disk during Jupiter's infancy. Recent simulation work of such disks finds that moons with a 1% or even higher mass ratio can occasionally form. And even if such moons are rare, they would be the easiest ones for astronomers such as myself to find. The final thing we can say is that most of our models prefer an inclined moon of around 45 degrees. That's pretty surprising and resembles Triton around Neptune, perhaps implying a collision or a capture. However, our constraints here are really fuzzy, so it may be that the system is revealed to be coplanar in subsequent observations. Okay, so we have these two anomalies observed by the Hubble Space Telescope indicating an exomoon, and when we derive the parameters of said exomoon, we get parameters which are a little bit surprising, but they are physically allowed, they are physically permissible. So you might wonder, should journalists, should the community be calling this the first exomoon discovery? Well, the word discovery is a pretty loaded term. When you read it, I think it implies a degree of certainty, that this object is absolutely there to 100% confidence. And as much as I wish that we had that level of confidence about this being a real exomoon, 
we're not quite there yet. But if this were confirmed, then it would be a first of its kind discovery. And it's important to remember that a first of its kind discovery demands a much higher degree of rigor, skepticism, and confidence than a run of the mill detection. For example, in the early days of exoplanet hunting, the first hot Jupiters found were met with intense scrutiny by the community because nobody expected to find Jupiter sized planets so close to their star. Yet, nowadays, if somebody finds a hot Jupiter, it is met with hardly any skepticism at all. And in the same way, had there been a dozen previously announced Neptune-sized exomoons by now, the addition of this extra object would hardly be controversial at all, and we probably in that case would call it a discovery. But the fact it is a first of its kind demands a higher level of scrutiny than we would normally apply. So as the old mantra goes, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence, and yes, we have compelling evidence that there's a moon around this system, but I'm not sure that our evidence is at the level of extraordinary yet. To have no doubt that this exomoon is real, I would want to see repeated signatures of the moon transit in future data sets, and indeed, that's what we're hoping to do in the future. Now, you might ask why even publish it then? Because the very moment you say the phrase exomoon candidate, science journalists get completely carried away, we've seen that before, and have a field day sensationalizing your result. Frankly, you know what, we've just kind of given up trying to control what the media write about exomoons. 99% of what you read about exomoons is wrong, and there's just nothing we can do to stop that. Science can't operate by teams such as ourselves refusing to publish our results and hiding behind closed doors. We have to disseminate our results so that the community can independently verify what we found and skeptically interrogate our claims. All we can do is try to make sure that at least our story, our version of what really happened is told. And that's of course what we're using this YouTube channel for. So if you've tuned into this, then thank you, because that means you're getting the story from the actual scientists who did the work rather than by third, fourth, fifth hand reporting. In that spirit, if there's enough interest, let me know down below in the comments section. Alex and I thought maybe we could do a live Q&A here on this YouTube channel. So that would give you a chance to directly ask us your questions about this system, what we did, the future of exomoon hunting. So let me down below if you're interested in doing that. Uh, if there's enough critical mass, then I guess we'll proceed and I'll post something about the time of when you can look for that. So there you have it. If confirmed, Kepler's 1625bi would be a remarkable system. A Neptune-sized moon orbiting a super Jupiter planet. If refuted, then we've lost nothing and the search goes on. We will find exomoons. The question is not if they exist, but where are they? In the meantime, we'll do our best to try and uncover the truth about this intriguing system. So until the next video, stay thoughtful and stay curious.